Hey everybody, it's your old pal John. Welcome back to the History Buff. Um, we're going to be doing some more uh, uh, American Reacts. Um, I'll be honest with you, these are the, uh, what is it, the 10 most um, significant moments in British history. Um, a lot of you like the American Reacts uh, idea or series, and um, I'll be honest, I haven't I haven't watched this, and I'm probably going to get schooled, and I know you guys like that, so. Uh, this is a, a Nerd and Dragon, I guess, is the channel, and um, I guess I'm going to get schooled. Hi, I'm Dave. And I'm Josh of Nerd and Dragon, and today we bring you 10 of the most significant events in British history. The Battle of Hastings, oh, 1066. No. The right. Battle of Hastings was... The one thing I... The only thing I know about... Well, I know a couple of things about the Battle of Hastings, but I know that it was the last... I believe it was the last invasion uh, from a foreign power, I think, to um, England, and uh, it was it was, it was was stopped. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to get into too much. ...fought on October the 14th, 1066, yep. between the invading William, Duke of Normandy, and his Norman army... Yep and King Harold II and his Anglo-Saxon army. The English were decisively defeated by the Normans, with Harold II dying in battle, allegedly from an arrow in the eye. Okay, somebody had commented that they weren't sure if he died in battle or not. Um, I guess some things take time in history to... Well, okay, some things do not... Um, are always not so obvious in history. So I guess whether he died on the battlefield or died after is up for debate that's my understanding um and that's from reading some of the comments well, i haven't you know i don't know a whole, a whole lot about it but i should william's victory ended 600 years of anglo-saxon reign huge changes would take place the normans took over the land giving those who toiled the fields new bosses and landlords norman french was mixed with anglo-saxon creating a new english language the norman conquest also provided better trade links to europe they solidified their conquest by building castles, fortifications and churches all over Britain. Mm. William of Normandy was crowned King William I of England on Christmas Day, 1066. Interesting. The signing of that? the Magna Carta, 1215. I know about the Magna Carta. I thought it was 1216, but okay. Magna Carta, liberty. And, and if I'm not mistaken, the Magna Carta, if I understand correctly, there were like three revisions... But, okay, all right. To give it its full name, is a royal charter of rights agreed to by King John at Runnymede on June the 15th, 1215. It came about after the English barons got fed up with the way King John was running the country, yeah. raising taxes and spending money. Right. The treaty set out a list of basic rules about how the country would be run, with the probably the most important being that no one was above the law, even the king. I love that there's a bill of rights in this that's that's interesting i've never actually read the magna carta uh, i would like to i, I don't know if, I, mean, I, I think you're allowed to i mean i'm sure there are copies of it somewhere but i would like to write that so it seems like the first um it seems like the if i'm not mistaken it's the, it is the first power check for a monarch or somebody in in charge so to speak i mean there there were these things in um in Rome to a certain extent, but uh, it, it, my understanding is it didn't go too well. <laughs> Due to it being a list of rules that applied across the whole of England for the first time, it is widely regarded as one of the most important documents in history. Yeah. Political rights, freedoms, social equality, the right to a fair trial, and limits on taxation can all be somewhat attributed to the signing of the Magna Carta. Okay, that's an important thing because, you know, Americans think, and I have to, this has to be said because this is an American reaction to it. Um, a lot of Americans, you know, we're, we're taught what we're taught. And that's usually, you know, that, you know, in a, in a weird way that America is sort of, you know, this, the, the, the center of the world. I mean, or at least, you know, more like we had a lot to do with the uh, 19th and 20th and 21st centuries. You know, we did, but it's a little inflated. But the interesting thing about this is our Declaration of Independence, our Bill of Rights, 
um, our constitution, a lot of that, I mean, I see it right here. So the ideas that we are taught are revolutionary are, are not necessarily revolutionary when you, it seems that you look at the Magna Carta, uh, especially the outline. So, I mean, it's, uh, that's, it's, it's, it's more of an eye opener. I didn't realize that. I'm putting that kind of together now. Um, but, uh, okay. Very good. Good stuff. The Arrival of the Black Death, 1348. Okay. The Black Death was a devastating global epidemic of bubonic plague in the mid 1300s. At Malcolm Regis, Dorset, in June 1348, the Black Death arrived on British shores, quickly spreading across the south of England. In 1349, the plague had reached Wales, Ireland and the north of England, and by 1350, it had reached Scotland. Between a third and half of the British population was wiped out. Although we now know that the plague originated from deadly bacteria, from wild marmots and gerbils, spreading either directly to humans or indirectly via rats, leading scholars and medical professionals at the time attributed the Black Death to various causes, including infected air caused by a distant earthquake, the planets aligning, God being angry and punishing mankind for its sins, Jews trying to wipe out Christians, and miasmas. Wait, hold on. I have to go back to that because I'm looking at this map here. I did know that it traveled extremely fast, but the one thing that stands out to me on the map, and I'll just put my cursor on it right here, is that Warsaw was spared. Uh, um, and I don't, I don't know, I don't know why. Uh, was it? I honestly don't know why. I mean, I'm looking at. Okay, London was. Says 1349 is when it hit London. I think the he was just saying the following years it hit Northern England and Wales, or maybe Wales first, then Northern England. It traveled very quickly. Um, so it certainly stands to reason that 1347 it hit Constantinople. I'm surprising it hit. Uh. I guess what would be Sardinia and Corsica, Corsica. Um, 1347, 48, 48, 48 in Athens, 49 Toledo, 49 Paris. So it kind of went up here. It looks like it sort of, it kind of went around and up and around, kind of like a swirl, like a, a swirl. It, it's interesting. Um, and I'm sure it was actually, these, these dates weren't exactly correct, but very, very interesting. The planets aligning, God being angry and punishing mankind for its sins. I hope they're being a little Jews humorous when they say trying this. Trying to wipe out Christians and miasmas, or the stench from privies and toilets. Okay. A major consequence of the Black Death was a shortage of labor, which led to wage rises. This annoyed landowning classes and led to the passing in Parliament of the Ordinance of Labourers, 1349, which stated that everyone under 60 must work, employers Ow. must not hire excess workers, employers may not pay wages higher than pre-plague levels, food must be priced reasonably with no excess profit, and no one under the pain of imprisonment was to give anything to able-bodied beggars. This act was reinforced by the Statute of Labourers in 1351, which prohibited requesting or offering a wage higher than pre-plague standards and forbidding people moving in order to find better work or working conditions. The Ordinance of Labourers and Statute of Labourers were extremely unpopular with the peasants who wanted higher wages and better living and working standards. These acts were a contributing factor to the upcoming peasant revolts. The beginning of the war of Wow, that is that's that's uh that's significant legislation. Um that's sort of like what went on well, I could say in the in the states, I'm I'm sure there were wage controls during during the World War One and World War Two to keep inflation from going out of uh to, to run, uh, keep it from running rampant, but um, and of course the result afterwards were, were riots in, in, in the U.S. Um, I, d I don't know about England. I should know that, but I don't know. I, it, were, 
were there wage um caps or or you know wage caps uh uh during during World War Two in in Britain and uh I assume there were some during in 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 Germany in the occupied countries but anyway interesting the roses 1455 I knew like nothing about the War of the Roses not gonna lie. The War of the Roses were a series of power struggles and civil wars between the Yorkists, the White Roses, and the Lancastrian, the Red Roses, factions of the Plantagenet family over the English crown. Okay, the War of the Roses started when Yorkist nobles sought to gain control of the English throne from Lancastrian King Henry VI, who was considered a weak king, lacking the mental capabilities to reign after the English defeat by the French during the Hundred Years' War left England in socio-economic turmoil. The first battle of the War of the Roses was the First Battle of St Albans in May 1455. A Yorkist army of up to 7,000 men decisively defeated a smaller Lancastrian force, killing three of its leaders, the Duke of Somerset, the Earl of Northumberland and Baron Clifford, and taking King Henry VI and his counsellor, the Duke of Buckingham, captive. The Yorkists will be in control of the country for the majority of the next 30 years. After 12 major battles, over 30 years of conflicts, yes. three kings removed from power, kings, princes, earls, barons and lords dying in battle, the decimation of the male lines and two dynasties, and a hundred thousand dead on the battlefields. You know about that. The final yeah. victory went to Henry Tudor, who inherited Tudor. the Lancastrian claim to the throne. He would become King Henry the Seventh, mm -hmm. first monarch of the Tudor dynasty, and father of possibly the most famous king in history, King Henry the Eighth. That's interesting. Discovery. Um, it did not. I, I. And I'll have to look more into the War of the Roses. I. I don't. Again, I don't know much about it. I know that. Essentially, the result was um, King. I knew the result was King Henry VIII, and the the Tudors were uh, the family in power. I guess you want to say uh, afterwards that was the result. Um, and I, I guess I, I think of it more in terms of uh, what what were the results of things. So you you Henry VIII and Church of England and all that. Stuff. Okay, all right. But again, I didn't, you know, it's an uncomfortable situ situation for me to be in reacting to this, but I guess the more you know, the more you don't know. The of the gunpowder plot, 1605. Remember, remember, the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason and plot. For I see no reason why gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. On the 5th of November, 1605, Guy Fawkes was discovered beneath the Houses of Parliament with enough kegs of gunpowder to destroy the building and kill everyone inside. The plan by a group of Catholic conspirators was to assassinate Protestant King James I by blowing up the House of Lords at the state opening of Parliament. Fawkes was tasked with the lighting of the fuse, but he failed in his mission due to being discovered. Fawkes was detained, brought before the King and locked in the Tower of London where he was severely tortured into signing a confession and giving up his co-conspirators. Mm -hmm. Guy Fawkes and other captured co-conspirators were tried, found guilty and sentenced to be hanged, drawn and quartered. Whilst most of the conspirators met their end this way, Guy Fawkes threw himself from the scaffold during the hanging phase of the execution, breaking his neck and dying instantly, although the rest of his sentence was carried out on his corpse. In January 1606, the observance of 5th of November Act 1605 was passed, making services and sermons commemorating the event an annual feature of English life. To this day, it remains the custom in Britain so. that on the 5th of November, we set off fireworks and light bonfires in commemoration of the gunpowder plot. Now, it's interesting. I, I did know it was still... Uh, the 5th of November was still celebrated today, um, which is really weird because... You know, I guess the monarchy's cool with that. Well, I mean, not the monarchy, but everyone's cool with that bell plot. But just saying, um, it's it's one of those sort of I understood it to be one of those sort of weird things in history. You know, like you still celebrate it, and 
I don't know. Uh, uh, and anyway, I don't know what to say about it. I mean, um, it, I'm surprised it's as big as it is. Um, for the 60, well, okay. Then it's still remembered, I guess. That's more of the, the thing. The execution of King Charles I, 1649. Okay. On January the 30th, 1649, King Charles I of England was beheaded at Whitehall. After almost a decade of civil war, King Charles I was defeated, put on trial, and sentenced to death. Hmm. The first time an English monarch had been put on trial. Right. Following Charles's execution, England became a republic called the Commonwealth for a number of years, first under Parliament for four years, until Oliver Cromwell dismissed Parliament to rule as protector until his death and the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. Yeah. The Battle of More Waterloo, 1815. Okay. On the 18th of June, 1815, Napoleon Bonaparte was defeated once and for all at the Battle of Waterloo. By the way, I am fascinated with the Battle, Battle of Waterloo. I think it's a very interesting uh, end to the Napoleonic Wars. Um, very, very, very interesting. Um, after his escape from exile on Elba, back to France, Napoleon regained power and once more set his sights on European domination. Fortunately, mm. his bid for rule was thwarted due to a combined Anglo-Allied army under the Duke of Wellington and a Prussian army under Prince Blücher. Yep. Despite defeating the Prussians at Ligny and holding the British at Quatre Bras, Napoleon was unable to secure the ultimate victory at Waterloo. In a close-run thing, the French were beaten and Napoleon eventually surrendered and was sent into exile at St. Helena, where he would live out the rest of his life. Yeah, I, I'll be honest, I love the... I, I'm, I am getting into the Napoleonic Wars more and more. Um, in a lot of things, like the idea of, you know, the core system of, uh, of you know, the army and, and things like that. Um, but uh, one of the things I found most interesting about um, the Battle of Waterloo is Certainly not just um, good generaling, a certain degree of timing, um, and certain, some mistakes, of course, but uh, and some good, you know, just good luck uh, to an extent. Um, but that Napoleon was not, I mean, he was finished after the Battle of Waterloo, but it's the, uh, it's the time from Waterloo to when he capitulated that um, um right now very interested in i think it's i think it's pretty neat because he he wasn't done i mean he was done but he wasn't really done uh, afterwards the signing of the treaty of versailles 1919 okay it's more the treaty of versailles more my time because you know american history and i hate to keep going back to this but it's the truth it's it's my context to understand a lot of world history because world history for americans once we get through uh, you know, the 1600s, 1700s, that's when uh, the, 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 popul the, um, the settlement of America happens. Uh, then everything that happens in the world around us after the, the, the 1600s or so, uh, it all makes a little more sense to us. But before that, you know, we have to really sort of figure out, like, you know, what was going on? Because we're, we're taught, first and foremost, our country's history. And our country's history doesn't start when, you know, European country history starts. But you choose one. Um, our history starts with people settling. So, I mean, we don't even get into, uh, you know, a whole lot of the native tribes. I mean, other than, you know, Columbus and, and things like that. So, you know, our context is a little different the way we look at history is the most important of the peace treaties that brought the First World War to an end. The treaty officially ended the state of war between Germany and the Allied powers. Drawn up by the leaders of the United Kingdom, USA, France and Italy, the Treaty of Versailles was signed on the 28th of June 1919 at the Palace of Versailles in France. The treaty forced Germany to surrender around 10% of its territory and all overseas possession called for the demilitarization and occupation of the Rhineland, mm -hmm. limited Germany's army and navy, forbade it to maintain an air force, required the country to conduct war crime trials against Kaiser Wilhelm II, among other leaders, and probably 
importantly, Article 231 of the treaty, better known as the War Guilt Clause, yeah. which forced Germany to accept full responsibility of World War I and pay 132 billion gold marks, about 200 billion pounds today, in reparations for Allied war losses. Germans felt this to be unfair and unreasonable, and it eventually became one of the things that led to the rise of Adolf Hitler and World War II. Yeah, that's a, a Treaty of Versailles is a very, it's a great exercise in psychology about how you, you know, how you should, I guess, how you want to treat someone that is vanquished. Um, uh, I, it was a tough treaty. I mean, it limited every, it limited German society in every shape and form. It was not basically, really was not until Adolf Hitler came into power that you know, payments started stopping, the military started growing, and there's that whole idea again of when the Depression hits in the 1930s, Germany has already gone through that because they've been, they've had rampant inflation, they've had to, they've already had their hard times more than anybody, and yes, they certainly suffered, but Germany became self-reliant and quickly uh, pulled itself out much quicker than anybody else um, from the Depression. but And that's all a result of the Treaty of Versailles. And basically, it's, a lot of people just think there's World War I or, uh, as the first battle and the, the break, and then World War II is the second battle. That's as if, I could get further into it, but yeah. It was, it was pretty humiliating. Pushed on mostly by the French, I think. Um, some by, what was it, Lord George, I think, uh, uh, um, who, who was the, I can't remember who the, who the, the prime ministers were, but, uh, somewhat more, or somewhat also by, by the British, I think they were a little, the English, they were a little less, uh, forceful with it. Um, I know, I know President Wilson wasn't, uh, huge on it. He was more concerned about the, um, uh, he was more concerned about not not pushing guilt, but he was more concerned about uh what was it what was it um uh Christ, what was he oh oh the uh um the precursor to the United Na Nations I can never remember that I have to like write it down um and uh, he wanted to get that up and moving and of course the U S never ratified it and it was not it was you know like unlike the UN it uh it didn't didn't have much bite to it as a matter of fact there was some weird thing here in the states that you guys might not know it was uh the planned invasion of canada after world war 1 just a sidebar here uh i don't know if you know this but the uh the america or america had a plan to invade canada uh between the wars because they were concerned that all the money that was lent to uh, Britain might be defaulted, and that the British might try to either attack through Canada or through default, and we would not get our money. So we actually had, it was called uh, uh, War Plan Red, I think. I did a video on it a while back, and uh, it's, it's quite fascinating. I'm glad we never did that, but there were some tensions about, you know, yeah, you know, us not getting our money. <laughs> so. VE Day, 1945. Yeah. Victory in Europe Day marks the day towards the end of World War II when fighting against Nazi Germany in Europe came to an end. At 3pm, May 8th, 1945, Winston Churchill made the radio announcement that war in Europe had come to an end following Germany's surrender. VE Day marked the end of Nazism and the start of political, economic and physical reconstruction of Europe. With street parties and dances, people rejoiced at the news of Germany's surrender after over five years of war. Despite wild celebrations and parties, the Second World War wouldn't be over until September 2, 1945, when Japan's surrender from the conflict was officially signed. The United... Yeah, it was a... that was a... It was a big moment. Um... England 
suffered roughly the same number of casualties as the United States. Um, just because when we got into the war, we had the United States had more, you know, more stuff, more, more people. Um, and we we starting off, we blundered quite a bit. Um, but uh, and and we were we were hit with the Battle of the Bulge. That was about eighty thousand casualties. So you're looking at about four hundred and change in terms of casualties. Um, or was it deaths? Uh, you know, the two countries were roughly similar. Um, population difference and time, you know, uh, you can understand how that turns out. But yeah, um, you got to give a lot of credit to England because we are talking about England. Got to give a lot of credit to England um, for holding out. And because of holding out, uh, the war was able to, um, uh, uh, you know, change them when, when other countries got involved. Um, I know we've gone over this before, but worth mentioning again. A couple things, you know, on here are always worth mentioning again. Kingdom votes to leave the EU, 2016. On the 23rd of June, 2016, the people of the United Kingdom and Gibraltar made a historic decision. They voted to leave the European Union. The European Economic Community was designed to bring economic integration to its member states. The UK joined the EEC in 1973. In 1993, the EEC, along with other European communities, were amalgamated to form the European Union, yeah. the EU. This meant that members, despite having their own laws and regulations, also had to adhere to many EU standards and practices. This upset a lot of people who felt that they were losing their sovereignty. Many Brits argued that whilst they had no issue being a member of the EEC, as it was beneficial to trade, etc., they had become members of the EU and ruled by Brussels without being asked to. Despite many arguments, nothing was done about the situation until Conservative Prime Minister David Cameron announced that should he win the 2015 general election, there would be a referendum on the UK's membership to the EU. The Conservatives won the election and the referendum was set for June 2016. Despite various opinion polls putting the Remain ahead, ultimately the people of the United Kingdom and Gibraltar voted to leave the EU. The turnout at the pollen station was the highest for any referendum in British history, with more than 33.5 million people casting their vote, 17.4 million voting to leave, with 16.1 million voting to remain. Okay, I have a question about this, um, and I'm curious because I've never asked this question before, and I think it's fascinating. Um, so you, uh, you join the EU. I, I think it's more of an identity that I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Um, but leaving, uh, the European union as a, first of all, I'm, I'm curious, would you be bold enough if you're, if you're, if you're English or British and, or yeah, in this case, it's, sometimes it's hard to know what I'm talking about when I say English, British, you know what I'm talking about when I say UK, but, um, would you be willing to put down in the comments whether you voted to leave or stay? Or is that a very, uh, is that a subject that people don't want to discuss because it's still relatively uh, fresh in your mind? Um, but I'm, I'm just curious. I mean, you know, um, that'd be like, maybe it's, is it like asking somebody if they voted for Donald Trump or not? <laughs> um, I'd be curious about that and curious if, to know if you, you, you still feel that way. That's an interesting, that's a video all in its own right, which I really want to get into. The vote split the nation. The prime minister yeah, who backed yeah. the campaign to remain resigned. There were protests over the result. An increase in hate crime allegations were recorded. There were petitions for new referendums. Applications for passports skyrocketed and stock prices fell. Although the vote took place in June 2016, due to political arguments and deals, the UK didn't officially leave the EU until January the 30th, 2020. The fallout from Brexit is still ongoing. So, do you regret it? All right, guys. I, uh, <laughs> I probably failed this one miserably. But let me know what you think. I guess, you know, um, you know, I guess I'll be thick-skinned about it, but... You know, I did look at some of these polls that I, I've put up. A lot of you want to see some American reacts and uh, uh, things like that. So I guess um, I'll be ashamed and embarrassed, uh, but that's okay. 
I'm all right with it. So, you know, I guess uh, let me know your thoughts. All right, guys, I'll talk to you.